All right, welcome to the Jeff Hagee Show. I'm excited today to have Evan Burke with me. Evan has a really cool story I'm excited to share. He comes from an NFL and college football coach background turned speaker, author, and much more. But there's a lot more to the story than just that. But we'll get into that. So welcome, Evan. Great to have you here. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Yeah, Jeff, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me on the show and having me I'm excited to share with you today. And uh, yeah, just real briefly, my journey, as you mentioned, I was an NFL and college football coach for 12 years. Uh, really fortunate to coach at every level of college football and in the pros. Uh, but one of the unique aspects of my career was I had a little bit of an unconventional path. I wasn't a, a great football player. I didn't play in college. I uh, obviously didn't play in the pros and, and I didn't have a, a dad or any family that was coaching or, or an executive with an NFL team. And typically a, a high level college coach or a professional coach has one of those aspects, either they were a college or professional player, or they have some family that's in the business that can that kind of get their foot in the door. I didn't have any of these things. Um, but when I was a student at the University of Colorado, I had this inkling uh, or maybe like this pull towards coaching. Uh, so I, I kind of had this idea that I wanted to explore what college coaching for a profession would be like. Obviously knew nobody, didn't know anything about the profession. Uh, so I figured I just had to start somewhere. And uh, that ended up being at uh, the Boulder Rec Center coaching fourth grade football. Uh, so those were kind of the humble beginnings, if you will, to uh, my, my eventual career coaching college and, and in the NFL. Uh, and really fortunate to coach at places like the Miami Dolphins, UCLA, SMU, to name a few. Um, and, and as you alluded to, uh, left coaching a couple of years back and transitioned to uh, helping teams and performers really achieve their highest level of performance. Um, and, and I do that mainly as a speaker and, and at times as an executive coach or a consultant, uh, but, but really enjoy sharing the stories from my career and, and teaching those same principles and strategies that I saw individuals and teams used to be successful at the highest levels and use them with my clients. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's awesome. And I'm excited to get into more of the story. And also, um, you know, I haven't mentioned the name of the book, but I'll make sure that it's in there in the notes and everything and the links are there, but it's finding intangibles and just, and actually I, I hate to say it. I haven't read it yet. It is somewhere between here and the Amazon outlet. It's in the mail right now, but it's on its way. But just reading what I have about it, I'm really excited about it. And as you and I talked before the show, my clientele are entrepreneurs and athletes, high achievers. And there's so much in this book that is going to be excellent for those that I work with. And so I'm really excited to get into some of these things that you talk about because I know it's going to really help the people that I work with and the people that listen to this show. But first of all, taking a step back to something you said, how do you go from fourth grade football to NFL in six years? Yeah. So uh, let's just acknowledge off the top that there is an element of luck in anybody's okay. success. <laughs> Um, so I, I don't want to just act like uh, I knew exactly what I was doing and, and had this path laid out in front of me. Um, but I do think that as much as luck plays a role in anybody's success, you play a role in putting yourself in as many lucky situations as possible. And I think indirectly, that was maybe a philosophy I had, even if I didn't fully consciously know that that was my philosophy. Uh, as you mentioned, I was, a, I was a fourth grade coach. And then after that, I was a, a, a coach at a local high school for football. And this is all while I was a student at the University of Colorado. So uh, like, obviously, I was in my early 20s, very early 20s, and uh, just had this desire to explore what college coaching would look like. And quite honestly, the year I graduated, I wanted to return to the high school I was at 
and, and I was a junior varsity coach at the time. I wanted to coach at the high school, at the varsity level. Uh, and I was looked over for another hire outside of the team. And they went and hired another receivers coach. And that was kind of my signal to explore other opportunities. And uh, I just kind of said to myself, you know what, I, I want to explore what coaching at a college would be like. Hey, athletes and parents of athletes. So much time, money, and effort is put into the physical aspect of your sport to become the best you can be. But the mental game, it's often neglected, and it's just as important as the physical game. In fact, it's usually the differentiator between the good and the great athletes. Come and join me in the Confident Athlete Program where you'll learn to control your confidence, develop a powerful mindset, and unlock your full potential. Go to jeffhagey.com slash confidentathlete to find out more. Without getting too deep into story time here, what I did was I wrote letters to every school in the nation. Nobody responded to me. I then, uh, this is probably late December, early January. Uh, I was returning to Dallas where I was from to attend, I think, my brother and sister's birthday party or something. And I called TCU, North Texas, and SMU, all schools within 30 miles of where I grew up, uh, and, and told them I had written them a letter and I wanted to come by and talk to them about being a part of the team. The coaches at North Texas and TCU told me not to show up at their campus, that they had no desire to talk to me and they weren't hiring and they, <laughs> they didn't want me to come up and meet them. But the coach at SMU invited me to come up and he proceeded to tell me this is now probably early February about an ops intern job that they had. And, and essentially this operations intern would be making photocopies, making sure that players went to class, monitoring study hall, uh, passing out Chick-fil-A's as they got on the bus when, when we traveled. All of the glamorous things that you imagine being a college football coach is, uh, is what he laid out in this kind of 15, 20 minute meeting. And after that, he, you know, looked at me and said, well, you know, what do you think? Are you still interested? And I can remember sitting there as a 22 year old thinking, this is my dream job. This is, this would be amazing. <laughs> Well, Evan, we're not hiring, so uh, but, but we'll keep we'll keep you in mind. And uh, obviously, I'd been trying to reach out to all schools in the nation, no success except for Coach Hyatt, Gary Hyatt at SMU, uh, and didn't even realize what I was doing at the time. But when I went back to Boulder uh, to to kind of where I was from and continue my coaching search, I just was like, well, Coach Hyatt was nice enough to meet with me, so. Uh, I'll just call him every couple of weeks and just see what's up with that volunteer opportunity. So I proceeded on this uh, a little bit of a persistent path of just calling him every two weeks and, uh, hey, Coach Hyatt, this is Evan Burke. I met with you uh, a couple of weeks ago. I'm from Boulder. Yes, yes, Evan. I, re I remember, of course. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to check in and just see if you'd hired that for that volunteer position uh, at all. Evan, oh my gosh, we're so focused on spring recruiting. Uh, we're not even thinking about that. Oh, okay, got it. Well, uh, no, no worries. I didn't mean to bother you. Uh, I'll talk to you soon. And I proceeded every couple of weeks to just like, as I put it, poke him in the shoulder, just a phone call, an actual phone call, not an email, not, not a text. Uh, I don't even know if texting was around in 2006. Uh, but after a couple of months of doing this, you know, continually telling me, no, they weren't thinking about it. Uh, I had actually gotten two job offers. One that was going to pay me like $30,000 to coach at a local high school uh, and a volunteer opportunity at Colorado School of Mines, which was a division two school in uh, Colorado. And uh, I called Coach Hyatt, asked about that volunteer job. Evan, we're so busy. We're not even thinking about that. Hey, Coach Hyatt, I totally understand. Can I ask you something? You're the only Division One coach I know or I've ever talked to in my life. I want to be a Division One coach. I have these two job offers. Which do you think I should take? And he goes, if you want to be a college coach, you need to coach in college. Hey, that's awesome advice. Coach Hyatt, thank you so much. I won't bother you anymore, but I'll bother you next year uh, after the season. And he goes, when you come back into Dallas, I said, oh, I'll be back in Dallas in three weeks. Oh, why don't you come by my office when you come back into town? Yes, yes, sir. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Show back up into town. 
uh, walk into the office. He then proceeds to walk me into the head coach's office and they kind of tell me, Hey, what goes on here stays here. All right. Like you show up here every day, you do what we tell you to do. And uh, of course I have no idea what's happening. Like I've already accepted my job at Colorado school of mines. I'm going to be a division two <laughs> coach this year. And, um, we walk outside the coaches, that coaches, uh, meeting, but by the way, it lasted like 90 seconds, right? Like I didn't say anything. They just told me, uh, you know, Hey, this is what you're doing. Uh, get out of here. And, uh, coach Hyatt's like handing me schedules and like when I'm supposed to be there. And I'm like, coach, Hyatt, what are you talking about? Dude, Evan, we're hiring you this job. You won't leave me alone about we're hiring you for this job. Um, and so that was how I got to SMU. Um, and so was able to jump from division two to division one, uh, in three weeks, I guess you could say, and, uh, was very fortunate. Uh, coach Bob Stitt was the head coach at Colorado school of mines was incredibly gracious when I went and told him that I had accidentally gotten a job at SMU, uh, starting as a, uh, an ops intern. And, uh, we'll never forget the way he treated me. He could have been a real jerk, but he wasn't, he, he said, man, that's, aren't you from Dallas? Dude, this is awesome, man. Like you would have been trying to get this job next year and, and, and happy to get it. This is so great. That's really cool. And I'll never forget that, but that started me on a four year journey at SMU. And uh, I did everything when I was there. I worked in ops. I worked in recruiting. I worked in video. Uh, I was an on the field coach on offense and on defense. Uh, I, I really felt that. And I think my mentality, even going in there, and I was kind of joking about passing out Chick-fil-A's, but I literally had the mentality that I'm going to be the best Chick-fil-A passer outer in the country. Like nobody is going to exceed my level of performance passing out Chick-fil-A's in the country. And I know that sounds funny, but like I was dead serious with myself. Um, if some, I was waiting for somebody to hand me copies so I could just make photocopies for them. So they, so they would know that they could trust me to do something so small. And I think it's a great lesson because I think when I reflect back, how was I able to go from ops intern sitting in the corner to an on the field coach, like the way I did it was a, a continual evolution of myself and, and focusing on my own growth, but also like this dominate today mentality on every single task that I was doing. And, and I didn't re quite realize it at the time, but I think looking back, like the reason I was able to elevate in that program was specifically because I had that attitude. So that's a lot. And I'm kind of like giving us, uh, bringing us up to the point of getting my NFL job. But that was kind of the five years preceding, um, preceding that time where I was a high school coach and then got my opportunity at SMU. You know, the, there's a lot in that story that can bring so much value to people though. I mean, one, the, the persistence in chasing your goal and then something else what you said there remind me of kurt warner's story when he is um stocking grocery sh shelves you know i'm gonna be the best at it until my opportunity arrives and so i guess, I guess to add add a little bit about that what you say for people who are chasing their dreams whether it's a coaching job whether it's a career whether it's in sports on persistence of chasing your goal. Yeah, I, I appreciate you outlining that. And I'm, I'm very proud of my path because of that. And it's interesting. I was talking to a former NFL player, former Super Bowl champion at one point who had become a coach and in kind of just a moment between the two of us, I was like, oh, like, you know, you, you became a coach, you have this background, people treat you a certain way because you're a former player. And like, look at me, I'm just, I'm just a nobody that like forced my way into this room. And I'll never forget it. Like, um, obviously a close friend of mine, but he was, he said, uh, you don't get it. My story is I was I was a player and then I became a coach. That's everybody's story. Nobody has your story. Your story is 
how you got into these rooms and how you were able to build trust so quickly. And that was really powerful to me because obviously in a moment where I'm kind of like trying to feel bad about myself, he kind of set me right. Um, and, and I think it's always important to kind of celebrate your own successes, uh, which sometimes can be tough, especially for us high performers, where we're always so focused on, uh, okay, I already did that, but like, what's next? And uh, I thought that was a valuable lesson, but I thought it was also a valuable lesson just to kind of appreciate my own journey. And uh, I, I would say to anybody out there, number one, you have to have a very strong vision for what you want to be and what you want to create. And I think that really powered me through a lot of the early adversity and challenges that I faced. I, I do not look like a football coach. People would see me in a room full of coaches and it's pretty obvious who are the, the, the typical football coaches and who's the atypical football coach. And you fight a lot of preconceived notions about who you are, what you're about in those situations. Um, and the only way that you can kind of get through some of those challenges maybe is by understanding for yourself who I want to be. Uh, I'm passing out Chick-fil-A's, but I have to do great at this so that I can do the next thing. Uh, and I think another important piece uh, specific, I know you work with athletes, Jeff. Um, I think aligning your actions with your goals is a really crucial step that sometimes we all miss out on. It's one thing to have a great vision. I want to be a division one player. I want to be an NFL player. I want to be an NFL coach. And that's great. But if it's raining outside and you kind of don't feel like working out, or maybe even a better analogy is like it's cold outside uh, and you don't really feel like running on the track. And, and like, I've already done it three times this week. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll like skip today and get tomorrow. And like, yes, we need our rest. We need to kind of acknowledge when we do need breaks, but if you're taking a break because it's cold outside, like that is not aligned with being a high level division one player or, or an NFL uh, a player at some point, right? Like the, the truly great athletes and teams show up every single day. And regardless of what type of vision they have for themselves, their actions are directly aligned with achieving that vision. Uh, so I think that's a really important piece. And I think looking back, I was showing up every day. Like I could have easily gone home at five o'clock at night, right? Like I'm just there to, to check class. Um, but the coaches stayed up there till 10 o'clock at night watching film, coming up with the strategy for that week's game. And I was right in there with them. And I'll be the first to admit, Jeff, I didn't do anything. I sat in the back of the room. They all sat around a conference table and I just sat at the computer. And when they said, hey, put on the Southern Mississippi versus Tulane game. I just went into the computer and found it and put it on the television, right? Like I didn't do anything. But those were like the early days of me witnessing, okay, number one, this is what coaches do, right? Like they're sitting here, we're talking about certain coverages they're running, certain fronts, how they're going to attack them. So I'm learning, but I'm also kind of getting the reps, so to speak, of being a coach, like being right. here till 10. And I'm building the trust of the people around me. They might walk, look at me walking into a room and be like, who is this? <laughs> Who's this guy they pulled off the street uh, to play football coach? But I think they quickly saw my intensity. Uh, it's probably coming through a little bit right now on Zoom, and, and I'll probably get a little fired up later and you can get a sense of it. But like, I carried that intensity with me everywhere I went in everything I did. Like, I didn't just pass out Chick fil A's. Like, I'm creating the foundation for the greatness that lays in front of me. And that was really kind of my mentality, I think, starting out in my career. And uh, again, it, it, there's some luck involved. and We don't have to get in all the specific stories of being yeah. at the right place at the right time. But like, had I not had that attitude and been doing the actual things that would lead me to success, uh, I never would have been 
quote unquote lucky in my career. So uh, I'm starting to jump all over the place, but, you know, talking about persistence and, and that's important, but I think having a, a true North star and aligning your actions with that vision and that North star are crucially important anytime you want to achieve something great. Yeah, no, thank you. That's great. So, so continue on. So it was five years there and then how did you end up in yep. the NFL? Yeah. So, uh, 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 four years at SMU and okay. then I, I wanted to go to the NFL. I wanted to give the NFL a try. As I mentioned, I had been in every department at SMU. SMU had just finished its first winning season in about 30 years, uh, in the two, after the 2009 season, we went and won the Hawaii bowl, huge accomplishment, a uh, huge, just personal achievement for me to be at that school for four years, back-to-back one in 11 seasons, and then for us to kind of have that success as a program, uh, and especially what you see that program as now. That foundation was built during that 2008 and that 2009 season, um, and I'm from I'm from Dallas. Like I, I graduated, I got my master's degree from SMU. So like I was extremely proud to be there. Um, but I just felt it was time to see if I could go to the NFL. Like I got to college and you know, whatever I got to <laughs> division not? one college in three months, like might as well try try the NFL, but I didn't know anybody. And uh, I think one other unique part to my story is like, I was always very authentic to who I was. Uh, so even though I was in this ultra competitive environment, surrounded by people, a lot of times that had performed at very high college levels or professional levels, that was not me. And that was lessons I learned early on. But obviously, as I progressed, I learned that like being authentic to who I was was crucially important as well. And so in that, I had a self-awareness to what I was going to come across or how I was going to come across if I was just reaching out to people to get an NFL job. I knew that you need to know somebody. I knew that you needed to have somebody on the inside to kind of help you in this. Uh, And I think that that was really crucial for me early on because I wanted to go to the NFL, but I didn't know anybody. So what I did was I created a spreadsheet that was the timeline from 1970 to 2009. And I had listed out every coach I had ever coached with and where they had coached. Uh, For whatever reason, I didn't feel confident going to those coaches saying, hey, can you make a call for me? That's also a really weird thing to do if they're not even comfortable contacting those people. So I made a spreadsheet where everybody I coached with had coached. And then I made a separate spreadsheet of every employee in the NFL. And I'm talking specifically about general managers, front office executives, player personnel, scouts, and coaches. And I did the exact same thing, 1970 to 2009. And there was no website to go get this. I just had to go to you know, the San Diego Chargers website and like read somebody's bio and like manually fill it out on the spreadsheet. Well, after I did this, now I had the entire NFL and then I had my network. And what I did was I just laid them over each other and everywhere I saw that a coach that I knew had coached with a coach in the NFL or a scout in the NFL where they had worked in the same place, I wrote them a letter. And I didn't write them a letter typed, printed out on a a sheet of paper. I hand wrote all of my cover letters, right? So instead of just typing it out, I hand wrote every single one. And uh, that ended up totaling 450 handwritten letters, to every connection I had in the NFL. And my letters were as simple as, hi, uh, you know uh, Coach Jones here at SMU. He says great things about you. I'm going to be at the Senior Bowl in Mobile in four weeks at the uh, end of January, and I'd love to get you a beer and get your advice on getting a job in the NFL or something to that effect. Um, some coaches who I knew were more intense, I would have a more like straight to the point letter, right? Like I was trying to emulate what would maybe get a response from them trying different things. So after 450 handwritten letters, I got 12 responses 
And I categorized a response as anything that was like personal, like, Hey, I haven't got your letter, not hiring, but thank you. And like, that's a nice letter or whatever. Yeah. I got 12 of those. And tw- those 12 ended up leading to three interviews with NFL teams. Uh, one being the Miami dolphins where I eventually caught on. So it was definitely an exhaustive process. And I'm saying it like, Oh, I did this like all in a weekend, Um, But it wasn't like that, right? Like we were preparing to play in the Hawaii Bowl, which is like before we left for the Hawaii Bowl, I was very, (laughs) it's funny. I hadn't like even thought about this uh, until just now, but like I sent all those letters like a few days before we left to go to the Hawaii Bowl because the Hawaii Bowl has a very unique thing. It's the only game on Christmas Eve in all of sports. Right. So it's the only game on. And I thought, okay, well, I'm at SMU. We're going to be playing in the Hawaii Bowl. I can send all of these letters through SMU's mail on SMU's uh, letterhead. And like, it's going to get on every one of these people's desks and they're going to see SMU in the Hawaii Bowl because it's going to be the only game on. And they're going to be sitting there with their families like, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm sitting here. I'll I'll watch this football game. So it's like I was like so methodical about getting things in front of them in anticipation of this. I'm writing them letters asking to buy them a beer in anticipation of walking up to them at the Senior Bowl and meeting them like all of these things I was kind of laying out and this all took maybe four or five months to come to fruition. Um, but like, a- as I was kind of alluding to earlier, you-, you kind of like set those small little stones up for yourself and it just allows you to kind of take one step at a time. Um, and-, and so uh, I-, I know this is long winded, but uh, obviously an exhaustive process and and like I tell a lot of people like oh was it worth it uh, I've walked I've worked with a lot of young athletes that are trying to you know go from high school to get an opportunity in college whether scholarship or just right. you know a, a, a spot on the team uh and I'm like is was it worth it to write those 450 handwritten letters well of course it was I, I got the result that I yeah. that I wanted uh now it took a ton of work but again, I was driven so much and I had this like focus on I'm going to get this job that it allowed me to kind of maybe go through some of the hand cramps and, and uh, you know, go through that period where I wasn't hearing anything from anybody and, and continue to be persistent and, and carry on. That's awesome. So besides Miami, how many teams did you coach with in the NFL? So Miami was the only team I coached okay. with in the NFL. Okay. And then what was it that made you decide to leave that and go the direction that you have? Uh, you mean leave coaching? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So after Miami, uh, I I, st- I was at two more colleges, McMurray University in Abilene, Texas, and then UCLA in Los Angeles. Okay. And um, after I got to UCLA, uh, you know, I'm in this great place. Uh, I'm at one of the most fabulous institutions in America. I live in Santa Monica, California. Like it was picture perfect. Uh, and I wasn't fulfilled and I wasn't happy. And I'm looking at all the people around me who are coaches, who are all divorced, who have been moving every two to three years for 30 plus years of their lives. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't necessarily want that. And uh, that's not to just say like all coaches let, live that lifestyle. I'm, I'm obviously just kind of sharing my point of view, but like I look 30 years into the future and I was like, okay, so when do I become happy and fulfilled and feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing? I had always been powered by that North star of being the head coach at Colorado. That was like what drove everything I did. It didn't make, it didn't make things easy, but it made things very simple. Does this job get me closer to being the head coach at the University of Colorado? Yes. Okay. I take this job. Uh, Yeah. I'm not quite sure or no. Yeah. I'm not taking the job. Uh, That was literally how simple my life was. Now, everything within that is difficult to to achieve and continue on. But uh, the moment, and this was towards the end of my last season, 2015, uh, was kind of as with any part of being in 
high performing athletics or any competitive industry. It's not always easy, right? Like we have moments, even as coaches uh, and, and athletes, where we doubt ourselves. Um, I had a moment where I was kind of like going through this adversity and like that North star did not bring me out of that, that adversity or that down Valley. Uh, and that was the first time that it ever happened. I could literally name you the, like the five worst things to happen to me in my coaching career. And 24 hours later, I was like, you know what? This is going to be a story I tell one day, uh, when I'm on ESPN and we're about to play for the national championship. And like, that's how I thought about things. And so the moment that that North star of being the head coach at the university of Colorado didn't bring me out of that, that was the moment I knew like something is wrong. And I don't know if I'm on this path for the right reasons and I need to leave this path. Um, and, and, and as you alluded to, I do a lot of speaking and coaching now. So uh, I tell people that I still coach, I still teach, I, I still have impact. It's just not on the sidelines anymore. It's just in other venues. So <clears throat> in those positions you've held, I mean, football coaches are some of the people I really look up to as great leaders. You know, you've got to be a great leader to lead a team and organization like that. What are some of the commonalities and great leaders that you've learned from what you've studied, who you've worked with, and what are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned working in such organizations? Man, yeah, you. I might get fired up with this answer, but <laughs> I, I think, you know, we kind of talked about it before, you know, they set very strong visions for their team. And I think it's not just because of the vision. I think it's other things as well, but I think they have the ability to kind of breathe a little bit of confidence into their team and the ability to elevate their uh, own thoughts of who they are, who they can be. And I think that's a lot of coaching, right? Like taking someone that's very good and making them great, maybe taking someone that's not very good and, and making them a good player. And uh, I think specific to leadership, there's a couple of things that I've noticed in the best that I've been around uh, that are evident in the, in the ones I've been around that haven't been, been very good. And I think the first one is ego. And we are all susceptible to our own ego. And one of the things that I've seen is this ability in the very best to eliminate their ego from what we're trying to do. The best coaches make it all about the team. And the ones that I've seen, even people that, you know, are very reputable, uh, at times lose sight of the fact that it has nothing to do with them. Uh, and that's very difficult in coaching because a lot of times, especially in college and in pros, these guys are making three, five, seven million dollars a year. Who is, who is uh, Evan to tell me what, what I'm doing wrong? Uh, who is anybody to challenge me? I got here based on my own merit. Um, but the best typically have this ability to make it not about themselves at all. Yes, they get paid a lot of money, but it's never about them. And so I think eliminating ego is one of the most crucial aspects to being a, a leader that allows their teams to reach potential. By the way, you can still be an egomaniac and still coach your team to a lot of wins, but like, we're not talking about winning. We're talking about performing at your highest level. We are talking about achieving your potential every single time you step on the field. And so if you don't have that, if you don't have that ability to create a, a vision for your team that is all about the person next to them, like you will fall short of whatever your team's potential was. Maybe it was winning half of your games. Maybe it was winning all of your games. Um, the other thing that I've noticed, this ties directly into ego, is the ability to admit their own mistakes. I think we would all acknowledge that any great person or leader has never been perfect, right? Like, I know this sounds simple, but you would be astonished at how many high-level leaders treat 
themselves treat themselves and what they say as gospel and cannot be challenged. And I know what I'm doing because my dad was this person or because I was at this place and we won, right? Maybe you had an elite quarterback at that place. Maybe there were other factors involved, whatever. Um, I've seen that time and time again, where it's about them. And when they make mistakes, they, they want to deflect to other people. The best leaders not only take all of the criticism and, and disperse all of the praise, uh, but they have this ability to create a lot of accountability and really kind of create cohesion through their own admitting mistakes, admitting the mistakes they've made, taking ownership. So I think today, especially with young people, you know, I say young people, I I guess kind of I'm young, I'm uh, nearly 40, I'm 39 years old. But I can remember growing up, like, I would never question my coaches, right? Like whatever my coach, whatever coach Ortega said within the St. Mark's wrestling program, that is what I did. (laughs) And no questions were asked. And I wasn't about to ask Coach Ortega. Um, And I've seen maybe a little bit of a shift in today's youth. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but like, I think today the majority of athletes want to know why. Oh, you want me to run this? You want me to do this drill? Why are you having me do this drill? A lot of coaches would take that as an attack. Yeah. But the best coaches would say, oh, that's a great question, Jeff. You know how I always talk about uh, if we're going to fight in the, Atl- in the North Atlantic, we need to train in the North Atlantic? Well, this specific drill is, is when things happen within the game specific to this, right? Like this is a blocking drill that exactly mimics what you're going to be doing on a wide receiver screen or whatever. Usually, if you can adequately explain that to a young athlete, in this case, a young football player, they're usually all in. Oh, okay, great. Now I know. Um, but I think a lot of times that causes a reaction in coaches where they want to get defensive. Hey, don't ask me, you know, don't ask me to explain my drill. Do what I tell you to do. Because I, I don't think so. that works anymore with, with young people. And I think that's, that's an adaptation that coaches need to make. Yeah. And um, again, like, People And I, I think this goes for teams I work with in, in the corporate world and executives like like people don't want perfect leaders. They want human leaders. And it's it's not it shouldn't be counterintuitive. But a lot of leaders think, well, I can't stand in front of my team and tell them I screwed up. They think I'm per- perfect. Right. I got news for every leader out there listening to this. They don't think you're perfect. Guaranteed. <laughs> Guaranteed. What they really want, because it's actually more detrimental to stand up there and place blame in other places and not take ownership. Because the moment you walk out of the room, by the way, I've seen this a thousand times in coaching and coaching staffs where it's like the head coach walks out of the room and everybody's like, oh, my God, this idiot has no clue. Did did he really just say what he said? Yeah, well, well, whatever. He's going to do that. You know, he's going to do things the way he wants. Um, And I've seen that a thousand times. And so it's like, what you want to do is say, guys, this was on me. I thought they were going to do this strategy. They didn't like, this is on me. I didn't do my job as a coach. That creates, that creates the following that creates the accountability. That's what you want. Nobody's ever going to be perfect. Um, And so I think this ability to admit your own mistakes, to eliminate your ego and to make it all about the team and the person next to them. Cause ultimately we're not here so that whoever the head coach is can get another million dollar raise. You may make more money than the entire staff combined, right? Probably in, in a lot of cases, more than any state employee in this state. So that's insane. Number one, uh, number two, nobody cares about you. We literally don't care about you. What they care about is the people next to them. And so the, the coaches that are able to create that, that esprit de corps, that desire to come through for the person next to them, 
those are the coaches that you see that are continuously on the podium. Uh, the Greg Popoviches, the Bill Belichicks, the Nick Sabans. They all might do it in different ways, but they're all doing the same thing. And you know what? I mean, these leadership characteristics that they all share, they go beyond coaches. I mean, it's in businesses, whatever, but even, you know, being a leader on a team, uh, one of the athletes, these are the same characteristics that are going to benefit them just as much. So thank you for sharing that. So you've also, you've recently written your book, um, Finding Intangibles. I have some questions around that. So tell us a bit about the book first, and then I want to get into a few questions um, and ask you about that. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up, Jeff. The the book is called Finding Intangibles. It is available on Amazon. And the book is really about the commonalities in all of the elite performers and, and championship teams that I was on and that I studied. Um, and what I found was that the best, whether we're talking about athletes or teams, were never the most talented. They always had the most character. And I started to see in my coaching career how we would talk specifically in recruiting meetings about, oh, this guy's uh, shoulders are narrow. Or, oh, well, he's 6'2 and uh, uh, three eighths. Uh, Ooh, yeah. Well, if he was 6'4, like we'd for sure offer him a scholarship. But yeah, he's 6'2 and three eighths. And I can just remember sitting in those rooms as a 22, 23 year old coach in my, in my heart being like, that's wrong. That's stupid. Why are you, why are we talking about this? Like, this doesn't matter. Uh, what matters is we just spent two whole days with this family and it's literally the nicest family we can imagine. And look at the, the young man that they have raised. And even though this guy's 16 and has narrow shoulders, like he's dominating his competition, right? Like he's got the talent, but he brings all these other things that nobody's talking about. And I've obviously, if you can't tell, been really passionate about this for the last 20 years. And I always felt like the people that were successful were successful, not because of their talent, but because of these intangible characteristics. And so what I wanted to do was write a book on, uh, well, essentially a book that I wish I could have read when I was 22 years old to kind of like give me uh, maybe the validation that my thinking was correct. Uh, But it was a book I would have wanted to use as a 22, 23 year old coach to teach me about how to build a winning team, but not just why character is important, not just like what the intangibles are that are important. What I wanted to write a book about was how do you find them? Like, what should you be looking for? Yes, like the coach, the head coach of the high school says he's a a hard worker or she's a hard worker. Oh, why do you say that? Oh, they're here every day working. Okay, like the the head coach at the high school benefits from their athlete being a scholarship player. Like they're going to tell you whatever they think they have to tell you for their player to get a scholarship offer. That's not the person to talk to. You need to be talking to the janitor of the locker room. You need to be talking to their academic counselor at the high school. You need to be talking about everybody that that player doesn't think has an impact on their life or specifically their athletic career. Uh, You need to watch them in their pregame routine. You need to watch them with your team, with their teammates, how they interact with their teammates, how do their teammates talk about them? Uh, These are all the things that I wanted to write a book about, about how to find these intangibles and essentially what separates the great players and how do you build a team based on character? Uh, Because my belief is, is that character is going to be the new competitive advantage over the next 15 to 20 years. That's awesome. And you, you actually, I think you answered a lot of my questions that I had leading into this because, because of this, some of the details you already talked about, but tell me a little bit more about the talent paradox. Oh yes. So the talent paradox is uh, in a sentence is talent is essential to success, but success is not determined by talent. 
And essentially what you want to do is you have to have talent. And so uh, I appreciate you bringing that up, Jeff, because I think a lot of times I get super fired up about the intangibles and about character. And at times I'm afraid it comes off like I'm saying like, oh, like all you need is character. And that's not what I'm saying. Um, I talk in the book about talent being a minimum requirement, not the only thing you, you evaluate, right? Uh, so again, that's where the talent paradox comes in is like, you need to have talent. I wanted to be an NBA player growing up. I wanted to play for the Dallas Mavericks. That was like my light, uh, goal in life, but I'm 5'10". I'm not very athletic. I'm not very good at basketball. Like, I do not meet the talent minimum requirement to play at high school, let alone the NBA. Like, doesn't matter how many uh, great characteristics I have. But, like, for people that have that talent, and let's just take football recruiting specifically, since a lot of this is where this started. If you are being talked about in a, let's just say, Division I football recruiting room, we're a division one football team and we're talking about a prospect, like they have talent. Now there's different levels of talent, right? Like we're all aware of that. Um, you know, there's some quarterbacks like Peyton Manning, where it's just like, Oh, this guy's the number one player in the nation. But there's a lot of quarterbacks that don't have the stature, the six, six, the two twenty, the the rocket arm, the intelligence, but they bring all these other things that can also have success. And yeah, their talent level is not Peyton Manning's, but they're good enough to be on an NFL roster or be on a college football team. And so I think like this idea that I'm saying that talent doesn't matter is not accurate, even though sometimes I'm afraid I portray it that way. It's almost like once talent has been determined and you create or you um, can get through the first filter in the talent acquisition funnel. Now coaches and teams need to look at all these other things. And a lot of times we say, well, he's a 10 out of 10 talent. So if he's a 10 out of 10 talent or I, I, I'm getting a little fired up, I don't want to cuss, but let's just say that person is a jerk. Okay. Like how do you evaluate that? Do we overlook it? Because I've been in plenty of rooms where we don't talk about that. It's almost like this guy's the top player at his position in the nation. Oh, yeah, coach. Well, like, you know, I don't know how much of a deal this is, but I talked to a couple teammates and they didn't really talk highly of him. And, you know, it was interesting. He set this like national record the other day and he walked off the field and nobody high fived him. And literally, didn't even get acknowledged by the head coach. Well, I don't care. That guy's the number one player in the nation. And if he wants to come here, he's coming here. Oh, okay. Right. So right. you can do that, but it kind of goes back to what I was alluding to before. Like just because that person is the most talented player at their position, first of all, does not guarantee their success. Secondly, if you want to build any type of sustained success or a culture, you need to have values that you stick to. So it's not just like, oh, well, his talent is overriding. And like, let's just hope out of these 25 players we add to our team that some of them have some characteristics that we like. The best teams, the absolute best teams in college and in the pros have rigorous standards, not only for their talent evaluation, but that's just one part. It's this character evaluation that sets them apart. Nick Saban, everybody's so quick to jump and look at Nick Saban and say, oh, yeah, well, he's the best coach and I'm sure he's cheating and he is the most talented players. That is not true. Nick Saban does not recruit the most talented players. He recruits the players that fit his program the best. And he's passed on guys specifically because they didn't understand what it was going to take to be successful at the college level. Like Nick Saban talked about this story one time where it was like a guy was overweight. Now, again, he's the top player at his position, the nation. He's dominating his competition. He's a 10 out of 10 talent. And the whole visit, they're like, hey, yeah, well, you know, 
if you lose 40 pounds, then you're really going to be at the top of your game. But like, you're not at the top of your game right now every day. Yeah. Well, you know, go easy at lunch on your visit. Like, you know, you need to lose 40 pounds. They get to the very end of the visit. It's the mom and the, and the athlete and Nick Saban and Nick Saban goes, what do you think you have to do to become a great player? And the kid goes, uh, I mean, I, I don't really have anything. I don't really have anything to improve on. Okay, you're 17 years old. You haven't even played a down of college football. We've been telling you for the last three days that you need to lose 40 pounds immediately to be a high-level athlete. Uh, and you're sitting here in my office right now telling me you don't think you have anything to improve on to become a great player. Or specifically mention the thing we've been telling you nonstop since you got here. So like in that moment, yes, a lot of people can make excuses, which a lot of coaches do. Oh, well, Nick Saban can do that because he's got five stars all over the place. Well, this guy's a five star, but he doesn't fit the program. He doesn't fit the characteristics they're looking for. And so you as a leader, as a team builder, have to have the belief in your values that like, no, I know what it takes to be successful. And it takes understanding that you haven't made it. It takes a, a, a humility to continue to want to improve, an ambition to be great and not thinking that you've made it, right? I'm saying all these things. Does this not describe Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant or Tom Brady or name any great athlete over the last 50 years that come to mind? Of course it does. Yeah, we look at those guys and we think, well, Tom Brady's the best quarterback ever. Okay, well, for all the millennials out there, anybody that's under the age of 35, Tom Brady had a pretty good college career, but yet was looked over by every single NFL team. He wasn't the backup when he was drafted in New England. He was the fourth quarterback on that depth chart. Nobody probably knows this or remembers, but Drew Bledsoe in the year 2000 was the highest paid player in the history of the NFL up to that point. So to think that Tom Brady would just like walk in there and had the talent to supplant, that would be equivalent to, I mean, I know it's Chad Henney, but it's like Kansas City uh, drafting a player this year who nobody has ever heard of or thought anything about in him being the starter in Kansas City two years from now. Everybody that's listening to this would be like, no, you're crazy. Patrick Mahomes is the future of the NFL. That is equivalent to what Tom Brady did against Drew Bledsoe. And I'm pointing this out because Drew Bledsoe is the quintessential 10 out of 10 talent. He's 6'6". He's 240. He, he was drafted. He didn't even need to play his senior year. He was so dominant and so good at Washington State. Like this guy is literally franchise quarterback written all over him. But yet Tom Brady was able to outwork him and create that type of uh, belief in his ability, not only from the coaching staff, but from all of the players. Um, and so it's like, you cannot acknowledge Tom Brady for everything that he's done without acknowledging that he started on that depth chart as the fourth quarterback and that he wasn't talented. Go back and watch that film. He was not a great quarterback. The first few years they won championships. He was kind of this quote unquote game manager, but what he brought was everything else outside of his talent. He brought the leadership. He brought the work ethic. He brought this relentless desire to be great, this competitiveness that was evident every single day they showed up to practice. And Bill Belichick was able to recognize, oh my God, like we might have something here. Now, of course, nobody knew what they had, but it takes that belief in what actually translates to success. Like talent can only get you so far. Uh, the Lakers just missed the playoffs. And it's like, they got the best player in the world on their team. They have the third best player in the world on their team. Right. Like it's not always about talent. Uh, I'm a little fired up right now, Jeff. So let me, let it. me take a moment. Let me uh, breathe a little bit and I'll let you ask the next question. <laughs> but like, suffice it to say, I feel really passionate about this stuff. And like the talent paradox is essentially talent is essential to success, but success does not determine your talent or yeah, is not determined by your talent. 
you know, and as you talked about character and all those things, you know, like you say, you get to that level. Talent is just, it's a given. You have to have that. You've got to be at a certain level. But even, you know, Sean McVay, he talks about it a lot, the character of his players and those sort of things. I, it is such a differentiating factor. So how is it that, you know, you look at these kids, um, whether it's a kid that's trying to get recruited to play college or a kid that's trying to get go from college to the next level, NFL, how do they differentiate themselves and bring that to the forefront? Because like you said, some you've got some situations where, you know, that stuff's put aside. We don't care. He's the number one kid. He's the five star. That's all we care about. Well, how, how do they, you know, when you've got two five stars, how do how does the one make his character stand out as that differentiating factor? Well, first of all, I think just being self-aware and knowing who you are, I yeah. think also specific to people that are in the recruiting process. And I've spent a lot of time in the recruiting process as a coach, So I'm very familiar with it, obviously, from my football experience, but also from my experience helping coach people through that process. Uh, You know, it's never as simple as, well, like these players are basically both the same people, right? Um, And so like, oh, well, one guy's a one guy's a jerk and one guy's a, you know, a nice guy. Like, let's go with the nice guy. It's never that simple. And I one thing I would kind of like recommend is obviously every situation is different, but like specific to like coaches that evaluate simply on talent and the ones that care about character. Like if you're talking to a coach, you know, I just went on a diatribe for 10 minutes about all these players that, that had to develop their talent over time. And the way they were able to do that was through these intangibles uh, albeit they did have baseline genetic, tra- genetic traits that allowed them to do that. A lot of coaches will just say like, oh, that's, that's BS. That's, you know, Michael Jordan, you cannot sit here and tell me that Tom Brady was not the most talented, whatever, whatever. So it's like, if you're an athlete and you're talking to a coach and you're asking that coach, like, what are, you know, talk about some of your decision-making factors, like what's going to make your decision between, um, players at this position and they just sit there and say, well, like I'm looking, I don't like narrow shoulders. So I like wide shoulders. And, um, you know, if you're not six, two, like, yeah, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, and they don't mention any of these characteristics. Well, if I was coaching you, I would say, you need to call that coach out now. Don't call them out, but just say like, oh, that's interesting. Okay, cool. So height, talent, ability. Um, do you ever look at, at character? Like, do you, you know, I don't know. You didn't even mention work ethic. Do you care about a player's work ethic? Oh, it was just, yeah, Jeff, of course. Duh. Yeah, well, I don't know. I just asked you what's going to make your decision. Um, and like, look, don't don't be a jerk out there, uh, you know, recruits. Like, just you right. know, play cool, be respectful. But like, you need to also take note. Like, that coach is telling you everything you need to know. Right now, if they start outlining some of these things, uh, pay attention. And by the way, most coaches are going to kind of outline three things. I talk about it in my book. Um, I I kind of bucketed everything into three buckets. Most coaches that are looking at character and intangibles, it's either within the mindset bucket, within the heart bucket, or within being a team player bucket. Okay. So, you know, for the, for the recruits out there, if you just want like three simple things to kind of like focus on and promote yourself, I I would always kind of point to your growth mindset. I would always uh, point to your heart, which could be you know, passion, your competitiveness, your, how important your sport is to you. Uh, And then the third aspect being a team player, like Jeff, what was the most important thing uh, that you accomplished in your high school career? Okay. Uh, Don't say that you were named player of the week, uh, you you know, the eighth week of the season. Um, That tells me as a coach that you're all about yourself, but if what you're all about is like, Hey, you know, coach, like I don't really get into individual success. Like I'm, I love being a part of my team. And I think the fact that we went from one year, one win my sophomore year to, you know, 
four wins my my junior year and then you know able to compete for a comp- conference championship my senior year i mean i would have loved to have won that game with my teammates but just getting to that point was such a great success and like I, i'll always just love being a part of that team it was just a great experience like for me i i would listen to that i'm like oh this person gets it they get it like it, it's not about them so Those are kind of the things that I think coaches look for and the things that you want to talk about. So for all the athletes out there, you want to talk in stories. I can sit here and you could read my book and like, you could get all the the stuff, like the the bullet points. Uh, But what you want to be able to do is tell your story to a coach. And so I talk in my book about finding the story right? So it's like, oh, this kid has had a lot of success. Well, why is this young man or young woman had success? Like as a coach, you need to figure that out. As an athlete, you need to figure that out. You need to be able to communicate to a coach. Like, look, coach, like, you know, I started wrestling my freshman year. I wasn't really good, but I have a really great coach in Coach Ortega. I I trusted in him and his process. Uh, And quite honestly, I got you know, the bejesus knocked out of me for two years by all the, you know, seniors and juniors. But by the time I was a junior, I had, I had started to kind of build my confidence up. And by the time I was a senior, just through going through the program uh, and showing up here every single day and understanding what it took to be successful, you know, I was able to compete for, for the state championship that year or whatever. Like, those are the stories you need to be able to tell to a recruiter to kind of outline, like, look, I'm talented, yes, um, and you can evaluate that, but you need to understand how I got here. Um, so I, I know you're kind of talking about recruiting and stuff, and I could go off on it uh, on about ten thousand different tangents here. Uh, but I think it's important to know, like when you're talking to a coach, not everybody's gonna like understand that character is a part of success. Like some coaches just don't believe that. So is that going to be a good fit for you if? talent is not your strength to get into that program, right? Like they may not offer you a scholarship. They may offer you a roster spot. Like, are you okay with that? Cause like, they don't care about all these other things, right? Like they're, they're not going to consider them. So um, I'm getting a a little kind of all over the place, but obviously I, I believe in not only being able to identify your intangibles, but also be able to tell some stories that kind of outline them for coaches, I think is important. Yeah, no, I love that. And I, and, and again, for everyone listening, it's finding intangibles is the book. And I will have the link in the show notes. Um, I'm excited to get into it because there's a lot of these things, you know, finding your story, all these things that are in there. Um, There is one more thing I want to touch on out of the book that, I just want to get you to tell me a little bit more about it is ignoring the unimportance. Tell me more about that. Yeah. And I, I kind of uh, had shared a little bit earlier about being in meetings and coaches talking about all these things that didn't really fit and, uh, or, or did, I didn't think were really important. So I think uh, ignoring the unimportance is really the unimportant things that coaches tend to use as a um, as a reason not to recruit a certain player or or a reason not to draft a certain player, right? Like, uh, yeah, the, ugh, like their hips just move weird. Now, like I will acknowledge that there are certain intricacies and nuances to evaluating players for for any sport that exists, right? Like I've done this for a long time and like this type of a walk, just, I have never seen a player succeed. Okay. That's that coach's opinion. But I think a lot of times we try and create reasons why somebody can't be successful. And I think a lot of times this sits in the unimportance. And so a great example that I use in the book is uh, Cooper cup, who just had one of the most fantastic NFL seasons as a as a receiver in the history of the NFL and he was the NFL's Super Bowl MVP for the for the Rams and uh Cooper Cup is now the best player at his position in the most highly competitive field in professional sports and he wasn't a first round pick 
and he's not 6'4", and he doesn't run a very fast 40. And so they were asking him about like the success he had this past year. And they were like, well, how did you, you were a third round draft pick. Like, how did you fall to the third round? And Cooper answered that, oh, I ran my 40 in 466, which for an NFL receiver is very slow and, uh, or considered slow. And uh, in the same breath, Cooper goes, yeah, I ran in a straight line, not as, quote unquote, as fast as they wanted. By the way, that was the only time I ever ran the 40-yard dash. I don't run the 40-yard dash in, in football, and I never ran it since then. And so it was like this idea that they put all of this stock into evaluating a person, uh, going to talk to all of these people around him, and yet... Whatever they think he is, he runs a certain time. Now, you can't go out there and run a six-second 40, but like the difference between a 4.640 and a 4.440, yeah, that's that's big, but like why is Cooper Cup successful? So like the unimportant thing is the 0.2-second difference between Cooper Cup and the fastest person at his position that's available in the draft. That's unimportant. What dictates success for a wide receiver in the NFL? Well, it's really not top end speed at all. None of the best receivers who have ever played the game have top end speed. Speed has very little to do actually with, with being a successful receiver. It has everything to do with being smart as you uh, release off the line of scrimmage, knowing how to set your defender up to, to gain leverage as you come out of your break your catching ability, all of these things, you wouldn't draft a very fast receiver who has terrible hands. If you had a great quarterback like Justin Herbert or Tom Brady, but NFL teams do this all the time. Oh, we're going to teach him. Yeah. I know he's been playing wide receiver for 10 years, but we're going to teach him how to catch when he gets here to the Indianapolis Colts. Like, are you kidding me? The kid can't catch, but he's so fast. And if we could just get him to catch, guess what? Every coach that has ever coached that kid has always said, oh, when we get him to learn how to catch, and it's never happened. And so it's this idea that we place so much value on these things that have actually nothing to do with what's important. And so like, even for athletes, you know, we were talking about recruiting a minute ago, if they say, well, you know, your 40 time needs to be faster, um, obviously be prepared, right? Like, well, does all, do all great receivers have to have a fast 40? You just said you discounted me as the wide receiver because I ran a four, five, nine 40, but like Cooper cup is the best receiver on the planet. And he ran a four, six, six 40. Coach Burke, do you think maybe you put a little too much um, emphasis on the 40? Uh, Now, I wouldn't be afraid to ask that, to be quite honest with you, because like force them to give you an answer and they'll give you some answer. Oh, well, the thing is, is blah, blah, blah. But these unimportant things coaches focus on all the time. Oh, he's six one and three eights. But if he was six three, I mean, he'd be a no brainer. Okay, the kid dominates. We love everything about him, but because he's one inch and five eights shorter than we desire, um, we're not going to recruit him. Now, if you're at Alabama or Notre Dame, go ahead and do that. You're getting the absolute best players in the nation. But if you're at SMU, and you're looking at a kid that's six one and three eights, and you're discounting him, even though he dominates. I cannot tell you how many times I've been in a meeting room where it's like, oh, if he was six foot tall, if he was six four. Well, guess what? If he was six four, he wouldn't be talking to SMU. He wouldn't be talking to us. He's he would be better than us. We have a chance to get this kid because the University of Texas has some archaic way of evaluating these kids. Yeah. Uh, and they think that because he's not six, four, they're going to cut him off their board. How lucky for us. Don't fall victim to the same mistakes they're making. So uh, I saw this time and time again, coaches focusing on the unimportance uh, for any young athlete out there. Know what you bring to the table and, and try your best. Don't get as fired up as I do. Um, 
but, but try and let it be known that like, coach, I honestly, I've had a lot of success in my position. Like I can't compete against, you know, the, the six, a high schools in the state of Texas. I'm in a three, a high school. All I can do is compete against the guys I'm against and I dominate them. Yeah. Uh, Cooper cup played division one, double a football and dominated the competition and dominated when they played up to like these higher level schools and, uh, Everybody made excuses, right? Well, he's dominating against Division One AA, and he's ah, he's ran that four six forty. Um, you need to understand what dictates success in whatever industry or whatever profession you're in, and you need to reverse engineer and prioritize those things that dictate success. This is what the entire book is about. What what drives? Uh, these great players and these great teams that have success. Yeah. Everybody's got talent. Every team has talent. Uh, it's these other factors, this work ethic, this mindset, this passion, this desire to be great, being a great teammate, being in it all about the team success and foregoing your own indiv- individual success that really dictates the winners and, and the teams that are able to succeed and achieve great things and, and championships. So uh, that's why I get so passionate about it. And, and that's a little bit about ignoring the unimportance and, and how it relates to my book. No, and that, that's great. And the reason I wanted you to go deeper into that is because I think a lot of people as they're chasing their dreams, it's those unimportance that create their own limiting beliefs because they know the coach, whoever is going to bring that up, that, they're an inch and five eighths too short or whatever it is. And that creates their own limiting beliefs that are holding them back. Well, what are the important things that are going to get around that? So I love that. So thanks for going further into that. Well, one of the things we haven't talked about um, is your podcast too. So why don't just do me a favor here and share, you know, like I said, finding intangibles, I'm going to have that link. I'll have all of your links, but let people know, where they're going to find you, where they can follow up and get more on this and find out more about you in general. Appreciate that. So Finding Intangibles uh, is available on Amazon. Uh, You brought up my podcast. Uh, The name of the podcast is The Highest Level. And it's a sports leadership podcast where I interview athletes, coaches, team leaders, uh, and, and really kind of exploring how championship teams are built and what leadership excellence looks like at the highest levels. You can find that on my website or on any podcast provider, the highest level. Uh, And you can connect with me on any social media channel at Coach Evan Burke. Burke is spelled B-U-R-K. Or my website, CoachEvanBurke.com. Awesome. Well, Evan, thank you so much. This has been awesome. Um, I'm excited about the book. Really excited about that. And just really appreciate everything you shared. And like I said, in the show notes, I'll make sure to have the link to the book and everywhere you can connect with Evan. So make sure to go follow him. Um, I can promise you it's going to be worth your while. So thank you, coach. Jeff, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to join your show today. And I know I got a little fired up, but uh, that's because you were asking really great questions. And, um, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to share with your audience. So thank you so much. You bet. Thank you. Why do some people succeed at all levels beyond their imagination while others struggle? The mind is the key to your success. Even the best strategy won't matter without the right mindset to implement it. For those who desire to be great, to do amazing things, and have an impact on the world, the Bigger Future Coaching Program is designed to take your life and your business to another level. If you're ready to make big commitments, be held accountable, and develop the success mindsets that will take you beyond your dreams, join us today. Find out more at jeffhagey.com slash group coaching. Some of you may know this, but in addition to my coaching, I've recently joined Geneva Financial Home Loans, a mortgage lender headquartered in Chandler, Arizona, as a mortgage loan originator. I've always had a passion for serving others, and now I'm proud to also be a part of Home Loans Powered by Humans. If you're in the state of Arizona and looking to take the next step in your journey, contact me at 801 830-3858 to start the conversation. NMLS number 42056, BK number 0910215, equal opportunity lender.